Happy Friday. Hello, Brent Orwell. Good morning. Sorry. How are you? Good morning. I'm Lisa. Nice to meet you. And here's the beautiful Ellie. Um, we are part of Team AEI. And everybody on this call is part of the AEI community. And some hail from Illinois, Florida, Wisconsin, um, Arizona, Colorado. So you got a whole community here. Um, last, I should tell you, full disclosure, one of your partners um, in research and writing, uh, we had Daniel Cox on uh, two weeks ago. And so we're excited to have you on today. Um, I spent the morning reading a number of your articles on AI, social media, um, work, workplace relationships. So when it comes to studying uh, the humans or the lack thereof with AI, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Well, great. Um, good to be with you all this morning. Uh, so um, at, at my job at AEI is to focus um, on uh, workforce development mostly. I do some work in uh, criminal justice reform, particularly reentry. Um, and uh, I, uh, my, my work is really, um, but most heavily concentrated in kind of thinking about work, the future of work, some of the challenges that we're facing um, in terms of uh, skills gaps and, um, and frankly, just numbers gaps uh, in terms of the number of people who are available to us to work. Um, and um, the work that I did with Dan Cox was really, um, we, we undertook that sort of at the height of the uh, conversation around um, the number of quits uh, that we were experiencing in the workforce and trying to answer, ask questions about why, uh, why people were leaving their jobs um, and why we were seeing such um, persistent kind of turnover uh, in the labor force. So I'm happy to go into just about any area that you want um, to talk about in terms of uh, employment, workforce development, um, artificial intelligence and its uh, impact. So why don't you give me a little feedback? What would what would be most interesting? And helpful? So historically, we usually have the, the speaker take about 10 to 15 minutes and just do an around the world of their different topics, giving the high levels. And since you have such a depth and breadth of research, um, uh, I'll defer to your wisdom. So why don't you just do a high level and then we have a number of questions already in the queue, particularly related to AI. And uh, so why don't you start with there and then we'll just jump right okay. into it. Well, I will do my best. I, I, for some reason, it didn't get communicated completely to me that I needed a presentation this morning. So I don't really have one for you. Um, on the um, on the artificial, artificial intelligence front, um, yesterday uh, I was um, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to roll out, as part of a press conference, to roll out a report um, uh, that the, um, the chamber sponsored. Uh, I was one of the commissioners on the... Um, on the, uh, the um, panel um, that uh, uh, of experts who uh, met for over a year to talk about the future of artificial intelligence and how it relates to the economy. My focus naturally was on kind of the workforce side of this conversation. Uh, and um, as I as I talked about yesterday in, in the in the panel uh, or in the press conference, uh, I made basically kind of uh, several major points. First was that the demise of human labor is greatly exaggerated. Um, uh, uh, and automation um, isn't, it, it, 
it has frequently been a cause of great concern, but it has almost never turned out to be the problem that people thought it was going to be. It creates problems, certainly, but not the problems that uh, people anticipate from it. Um, what we've seen over a couple hundred years of, exper of experience with automation is that automation is critical to growing the economy. Uh, it's critical to increasing productivity uh, and efficiency, and it is the surest pathway to raising income uh, for American workers. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't create its own challenges, but the long-term, that's the long-term pattern that, um, that I think is pretty reliable. Um, everybody says, well, maybe this time is different. Maybe it is different this time, but um, it's also uh, in every other episode of um, automation that we've experienced, um, uh, you know, it's been, it's been said that that was, that was different as well. Um, so, so that's kind of one major thought. Now, having said that it's an overall good does not mean that it's going to be good for, for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Uh, there are going to be dislocations. Um, people are going to lose their jobs. Um, the job, some of the jobs that we currently have. Um, uh, so that's certainly true. Even more true, I think, though, is that artificial intelligence is really going to reconfigure the way that um, people do their jobs. Uh, and, um, and that's probably at least as big a challenge, maybe bigger, um, than, um, than the actual job loss. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's a pretty, that, that, that raises a, a set of questions about what we ought to be doing about it. Um, what, how can we help workers prepare for the adjustment that they're going to be facing? I think um, one thing that needs to be done is to put in place um, support um, for workers that um, uh, uh, support for workers that can help them adjust to the transition. We've had some experience with this. We've got a program called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. It's been around since the 1960s, um, which uh, for many workers has been very helpful. Uh, in the transition from uh, the industrial economy to the information economy. Um, it's not perfect. It it's not something that I, you know, would say, boy, this is uh, the, the solution. But I do think what it points to is that we need um, the kinds of supports that trade adjustment assistance provided, but applied more broadly to people who are impacted by automation and not just trade. Uh, those kinds of supports include retraining, um, uh, uh, resources for retraining. Uh, they include wage insurance if people are forced to take a lower paying job than the one that they that they were automated out of. Um, uh, and other kinds of um, uh, relocation and other kinds of transition systems to help people sort of reconnect um, to jobs um, if they lose them. The second thing I think is really essential, and it's a project that I'm working on right now um, at AEI, is that we really need better estimates in terms of labor market data as to the kinds of effects um, and uh, that AI is going to create in the economy. We have the sense that it's going to be quite expansive, that it's going to reach into basically all areas of the economy. Um, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean it's going to hit everywhere, uh, like I said, everywhere and everyone all at once. Um, rather, it's it's there are some industries and some occupations that are more exposed to AI than others. And what we need are better labor market information tools to help individuals, to help uh, businesses, to help workers, to help communities prepare for the transition. So that's another really key area. Uh, our labor market information, uh, it lags. Uh, it's not 
very granular. It's typically pretty high level, national in nature. When we, what we really need is much more timely information and adjusted and focused um, for uh, local communities. Um, a third area that I think is really important um, is that we need to look at the way the tax code interacts with the automation question. Right now, uh, businesses receive a much larger tax benefit for investments in non-human capital than they do in human capital. Uh, that hasn't always been the case. In 1986, the last time the tax code was uh, seriously reformed, uh, businesses um, uh, had equal opportunity to deduct expenses associated with investments in human capital and invest investments in plant and equipment. Uh, right now, it's substantially more favorable for plant and equipment. And I think that tends to drive businesses toward um, what's called labor substitution investments, um, using, um, using machines to replace labor. That's not where we're going to get the big productivity increases. What we need are um, strategies that help to integrate human and machine labor and, uh, because that's where we really get um, the big productivity increases. Um, so those are uh, sort of a few of my high level thoughts on uh, artificial intelligence. I see some questions coming in here already. Um, let me take a look at those. Oh. Um, what do I think um, are the two or three top skills availability gaps? Um, so I think this is a this is a question that's often top of mind um, for uh, particularly for students uh, and um, people who are transitioning from education into the economy is what should I be trying to learn? Um, we've had uh, many years of uh, heavy emphasis on training in technical, scientific, scientific, technical, engineering, and mathematics occupations. Um, and um, from my perspective, if somebody is trying to understand um, this transition that we're in, it doesn't really make sense um, to me that we should cha be channeling so many people into technology when technology is becoming a self-renewing um, area of the economy. One of the um, aspects of artificial intelligence is that uh, it's, you know, it's machine learning. It's large language models that have their own trajectory of self-improvement. Um, we've now got um, uh, uh, machine learning programs and software that will do, for instance, a lot of coding um, that in the past um, human beings have been responsible for doing. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't need people to code, but telling people to learn to code, I think, was never very good advice. Uh, and I think it's uh, increasingly um, bad advice. Um, what we actually need, I think, and this is the big skill gap moving into the future, is that all Americans at any stage in their career really need to be comfortable in using artificial intelligence. Um, it is, uh, I keep comparing it um, to learning a new foreign language. Uh, it is, um, uh, it, it, it is an incredibly powerful tool I've been using it some myself, and I, I'm frankly I'm kind of blown away at how good um, some of the technology is, um, at least from the standpoint of somebody who has to do a lot of research and writing. Uh, and um, but it it's he it heavily depends on the capacity of the user <clears throat> to ask good questions, uh, and so learning how to ask good questions is um, it is probably one of the most important skills for the future in terms of interacting with this technology. It will, uh, it will get better over time um, and become even more useful than it is right now. Uh, it is actually quite good right now in terms of prompting the user to ask better questions or to provide information that you didn't even know that you needed, 
but is really handy to have. And I'll give you a very um, uh, sort of banal kind of example of this. I've got a 22 year old son who uh, is in a um, is in a career development program, and he was ill. And um, but it's a new school for us, so I um, I wasn't I didn't have the number at my fingertips. So I was using the new Bing um, search engine, which has uh, an AI built into it. And I thought, well, this will be an interesting test. You know, how expansive is the knowledge of this database? And so I asked the chatbot, uh, the algorithm, to please find the number for the attendance line for my son's school. And I had no confidence actually that the chatbot would be able to answer that question because it's pretty detailed and obscure thing. Uh, but within 10 seconds of asking that question, I it came back with the attendance line number for the school. But then it went beyond that and it said, it might be easier for you if you just sent an email. And here's the email address for the uh, for the attendance reporting system. Now, in other words, the, the AI gave me a better, uh, it, its answer was better than the question that I asked. And I think that points to this need to really get good at asking questions and to ask the questions in the way that the algorithm, it gives the algorithm the most guidance that it can, uh, that we can provide it so that it can get the information that we need. Now that's not a technical skill in the sense of uh, I, I, you know, learning how to code or you know, learning a coding language. It's a, it's a um, much more of an imaginative and creative skill um, that we need to focus on. So- We have a follow up question yeah. to th this. And it's, you mentioned before the story um, of your son and the, the school. You said people need to get more, and I'm paraphrasing, people need to get more comfortable using AI and they have to learn it like a foreign language. For the people on this call or whomever, where does one go and who do we go to to say, okay, he, we need to use AI because it would be faster. How does that happen? Where do we well, go? To what I would suggest it? is, um, first of all, signing up for um, uh, either chat GPT-3, which is the underlying technology that was released back in October, which is now being sort of deployed into a bunch of different systems. And um, so I would sign up for that. You can go on to search for chat GPT-3 uh, through OpenAI is the name of the company that uh, sponsors it and gets signed up to use that. And then just start playing with it. Um, I would also suggest that you get on the waiting list for the new Bing um, uh, 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 AI. Um, they're sort of gradually expanding access to it. Um, uh, and again, get on there and start using it. There's a uh, Microsoft, which is owns Bing, right? Um, they use the chat GTP um, large language model and algorithms in their technology, but they have substantially improved over the chat GPT-3. I mean, it's amazing that in, in the, that was chat GPT-3 came out in October, Bing chat came out in February, and it's just an, uh, a, a logarithmic improvement in, uh, in, the, in the Bing search engine. So getting on and just trying it, working with it, um, using it for both practical matters, like the example that I gave, and any areas that you're just interested in researching on, um, you know, uh, or that you wanna know more about. So uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, there is also, and I'll be glad to look this up and send it around, but there's a, a very short online course uh, that can provide you with some of the um, skills uh, or 
or help you learn some of the skills associated with how to ask how to ask the questions in a way to get the responses that you're seeking. Um, so that's another way. But I think the most important thing is for people to spend the time beginning to educate themselves um, about this technology. Um, and that's just a matter of getting on the computer, getting on the internet, and and um, starting to read um, about uh, what the technology is and how it works. The, uh, I've, I've seen a number of stories about this in the last um, couple of weeks, but uh, there's an, an emerging new job title, and it's called a prompt engineer. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, it's learning how to prompt AI in order to get the information that you want, the information that you need. So that's another area to spend some time reading on is what is a prompt engineer and how do they do their jobs? Um, and just beginning again, you do not need to be an expert in order to use artificial intelligence. You're not designing artificial intelligence, you're using artificial intelligence. And for 98% of the population, that is the key challenge is learning uh, how to use it. Um, we have a follow-up question from Jim Curtis. Um, Jim, do you wanna ask your question? So the if uh, Jim wrote it in the chat here, which is what about future employment and unemployment trends? Um, does AI portend any major impact on this balance? Uh, uh, this is uh, what I meant at the beginning about I think that the um, some of the doom saying uh, about the impact of AI on employment uh, is um, greatly exaggerated. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, we live in this, you know, this economy, it's $23 trillion, um, is the total size of the economy. That's a pretty big economy. Whatever happens with AI, um, it's going to be gradual. Um, uh, it's, it's going to feel abrupt. But the actual real world impacts are going to be pretty gradual, I think, because it requires a lot of investment on the part of businesses to incorporate it into their business processes. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is our labor force is not growing nearly fast enough to keep up with economic growth. Um, between 2005 and 2012, we added almost 11 million workers um, to the American workforce. Between 2017 and 2022, we added just over a million workers. So the rate of growth in our workforce isn't sufficient to keep up um, with uh, growing um, uh, economic activity. And I think what that says to us is that AI, to the extent that it is um, coming into the economy and taking over more, act, more activities is actually pretty well-timed um, in this economy uh, because we just don't have the people that we need. This is the biggest challenge that we face moving into the future is that we don't have enough people. And um, AI can extend human labor. Um, that's we need that's the way that we need to think about it it's going to allow people to do more things it's going to allow them to do things more quickly and more efficiently and um and that's why i i, I think this is uh, on the whole going to be a great benefit um to the economy so i'm not worried about technological unemployment as i said at the beginning we have worried about that for 200 years uh, with every new technology that comes online, uh, it's going to put us out of work. And all it does actually is to uh, create more work um, and provide human beings with more opportunities to work. So um, I think that that kind of concern is, um, is really probably overdrawn. We have one question um, that was texted in and another question from the awesome Bob Crawford. Bob, do you want to ask your question? 
Yes, Brett, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Good, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion. <clears throat> Let's assume for a minute, Brett, that not that you're wrong, but that uh, the need for jobs is faster than you might project. What is there that's going on in AI right now? You know, in what I'd call conversations in the hallway, you know, quiet discussions about ways that we can stimulate economic growth, new businesses, new directions, creative new ways. I mean, we've got to be sure we're right on this. And, you know, everything you say is that uh, technology is going to create the opportunities, but how sure are we? So um, it's, it's I'm great. interested in the quiet questions that um, no. and the intimacy of uh, your uh, sacred halls, what you got to talk So uh, the short answer is, and I, I wrote, if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, you can. I, I spent a lot of time on Twitter and I, I unspool a lot of my thinking uh, uh, out there. Um, but one of the things I wrote about this morning is uh, that um, the economic future is, uh, by definition, unknowable. Um, we only pretend to a kind of knowledge that we can't actually have because we aren't talking about one economy, actually. We're talking about dozens or even hundreds of regional economies within the United States, and each one has its own makeup in terms of people and skills and technology. And so um, the question then can be, becomes, if you can't make projections, if you can't make predictions, as Yogi Berra said, you know, predictions are very difficult, especially about, the, uh, especially when they're about the future. Um, uh, if you can't make predictions with any kind of certainty, then what do you do um, uh, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, how to place your bets um, in terms of education and training and getting ready for the future? You know, catastrophes can help, can happen. You know, I, it, it is possible, not likely, I think pretty unlikely that we could see you know, a massive economic downturn that's going to throw millions of people out of work. But I think that's extremely unlikely. So what we will experience, the, the future will look, I think, very much like the past in terms of the cycles that our economy goes through. Sometimes we have growth and high employment and rising wages, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we enter periods of stagnation or that or or downturns or recessions. And, uh, you know, our big asset here is that we are, you know, we're a free country and a free economy uh, and people will figure out ways of coping um, with, with, these, with these changes. So um, I can't speak for every scholar uh, at AEI or if the, that there's some sort of consensus about the future, but I think our bet as an institution is on liberty and on the American people and on a free economy. Uh, and, um, and I think that if we, um, we, if we place those bets and we keep them, um, you know, there's a, there's a bright future for, uh, for everyone um, who wants to take part in, in our economy. And conversely, uh, there will be challenges, and we're just going to have to work on those challenges um, as they emerge, rather than trying to um, anticipate them and prevent prevent every problem from happening. That's just not that that's just not realistic. We have a dark question that scares me that was texted in, and it relates to AI and social media. And the mm -hmm. question is, and the question is this: You talk. In one of your articles, um, the person writes, you talk about the role of big, the discord and big tech is profitable. How does AI fit in all this? And how do we, um, as a democracy, mm -hmm. how do we deal with social media? So 
dark question, lots of topics. I'm not sure how to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, social media has been around 10 years or 10, 12 years now, um, which feels like it's been, and it's such a part of our lives that it feels like it's been around forever. Um, but we're very, very early in this. Um, uh, and some of the effects have been quite negative, as we've seen uh, with disinformation and misinformation. Um, but uh, on the whole, social media and um, the artificial intelligence behind it has been an enormous benefit, right? So we we tend to focus on the problems um, and sort of brush aside um, uh, the ways in which this new technology has made life better. So I am, I mean, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a utopianist, if that's a word, about technology. I think it always comes, uh, opportunities and challenges always come in the same package. And so we have had significant challenges um, due to uh, social media, but we've also derived an enormous, enormous amount of benefit from it and the technologies that that lie behind it uh, in terms of creating uh, new value, new efficiency um, uh, in the economy. So I think it's it, we just have to bear in mind that nothing nothing is an unalloyed good. Um, there's always dross, you know. There's always flaws. There's always downsides. Um, but I think in general, uh, the 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 arrows point toward uh, progress and improvement. So, um, in addition to which, on the on the negatives of social media and the negatives of some of our advanced uh, or you know leading edge technology, um, I'd also say that um, this is not a problem of technology per se. This is a problem of people. Uh, and, um, you know, for, I'll, I'll just give you a for instance here um, with, the, with the new kind of uh, chatbot technology that people, if, if you want to, you can go online and you can feed a lot of questions to a chatbot, confuse it, and get it to do weird things. If that's your objective, you can do it, right? And and as time goes on, technology will get better. It'll, it'll figure out ways of deflecting uh, the misuse. But the misuse is not a problem of the technology. It's a problem of the user. Uh, there's a great deal of social alienation in this country. And that social alienation manifests itself um, in... Uh, negative behaviors online and negative behaviors in the real world. Um, but getting rid of or limiting or constraining the technology doesn't get rid of the, the behaviors and the attitudes and beliefs that, um, that drive uh, that social alienation. So I, I think we need to be just be very clear in our own minds that um, while uh, the social media companies um, bear some responsibility in the way that their algorithms are constructed and driving some of this behavior. The impetus for that behavior comes from within us, not from within the technology. So self-control and having good people. Yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, self-control is, is important, but even below that, I mean, I think that if we're if we're concerned about not getting along with our neighbors, maybe we should learn how to get along with our neighbors um, rather than saying, um, you know, like a bank robber stop me before I rob a bank again. You know, it uh, you need to, to you, you need to go and engage in your own community. Uh, to begin to, it, you know, if enough people do that, you begin to dampen down some of this, uh, this bad behavior that we see. Got it. And we have um, another question from Jim Curtis. Jim, do you want to ask? Oh, you're muted.
still muted. Yeah, is your, it, 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 go. go ahead. Well, my question is about uh, academic uh, curricula and research on uh, AI. Is there uh, is there any ad advantage attraction of uh, AI activities to these institutions or not? Is it so individualized that uh, there's a uh, resistance? What's your opinion there? Uh, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. You're asking, are higher ed in institutions adapting in terms of curriculum and research? Was yes. that your question? Okay. Yeah, in, yeah. in, in yeah. AI and uh, research related to AI, and <clears throat> certainly smart people think in terms of uh, special areas involving arti artificial intelligence, and their ability to attract grant money to do research and to be uh, leaders in the uh, development of it. Yeah, I, I would say that there are few topics that are more prevalent in people's minds uh, within um, uh, research institutions, higher education than um, artificial intelligence and its implications um, uh, not just for the way that we educate, but the, really the way that we live. Um, there's, <clears throat> there's a very interesting project at Stanford University called the Human uh, Human Centered Artificial Intelligence um, Initiative uh, that attempts to incorporate not just their computer scientists, but people from uh, the social sciences and humanities in a conversation about. Uh, how do about how we go about shaping AI in a way that serves uh, human beings rather than the other way around? Um, and, I, and and that's just one example. There are similar initiatives at MIT, and um, and every college and university is trying is grappling with this and trying to figure out um, sort of how they're going how they're going to respond. Um, uh, to it. So, yeah, tremendous amount of ferment um, out there right now on this topic, uh, and deservedly so. Um, this is going to be transformative. It's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be like the introduction of electricity or transistors or the steam engine or the uh, uh, the looms, the textile looms back in the um, in the 18th century. Yeah, that really revolutionized um, all of those technologies. Revolutionized uh, not just the economy, but had significant impacts on the way that people live. So I think that that's very much um, on the agenda. Certainly on my agenda at AEI, where I'm trying to uh, help bring our scholars together from a variety of domains to think together about how AEI uh, how how AI is going to affect domestic policy, foreign policy, national security, um, the law, uh, cultural issues. Um, uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I, and I, I think that's all needed uh, uh, and um, I'm looking forward to trying to help push it forward. I would think the business schools in particular would be scrambling in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. There's a story this week about, you know, we've, we've read and heard a lot about the layoffs in the tech sector um, over the last few months. Um, and that's starting to spill over actually into um, MBA programs where students who are graduating with MBAs who saw who imagined themselves going into uh, technology firms um, because there was there had been so much demand um, uh, within those firms for um, uh, for business skills um, are finding uh, finding it harder and harder to find jobs right now in those firms um, and so uh, this uh, the slowdown. Uh, that we're experiencing, right? It's it's weird, right? Because on the one hand, AI is has broken out of 
the technology sector and it's getting into the what I call the real economy of things and and services that's all happening at the same time investment going into AI itself has really slowed down uh, because of the uh, uh, rising because of rising interest rates so uh, I think there's a lot more opportunity in the U.S. economy outside technology right now than there is inside technology, which is sort of counterintuitive um, from my standpoint, because we hear so much about uh, high tech. There was a question texted in, um, and it's a simple question. Who controls AI? Uh, uh, how, that's how is it? I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, is there any security risk with AI? Absolutely. Uh, there's security risk. There's privacy risk. Uh, there is uh, there's national security issues. It's all kinds of issues um, related to various forms of security in AI. And uh, the answer of like who controls it uh, is in a sense nobody and everybody. You know, every company. Um, that uses the technology, it's going to have to figure out how to ensure that it's used well, that it isn't abused, and that it doesn't create leakages in areas of privacy and security. Um, there, uh, it's extremely difficult um, to, in a, in a technology that is changing so rapidly, extremely difficult for government to do that. Uh, in fact, I would argue and wrote in a piece uh, earlier this week, if you want to look it up, uh, called the Federal AI Shambles. Um, uh, the, the federal government is well, well behind the state of technology. Um, and it's, I, I think, given how fast technology is changing, very unlikely to catch up. So we're going to need some alternative structures for um, monitoring and regulating uh, AI. And I I think the, the most promising pathway is creating public-private partnerships with industry to help develop standard, help develop uh, more rigorous and more um, broadly shared standards around, uh, um, around how AI should operate. Thank you so much. We have about two minutes before our call wraps up. Um, any final questions or any closing thoughts? One uh, final thought from my point of view would be the uh, what we've learned over the last few months on the Twitter files and the role of government and uh, superimpose uh, AI uh, possibilities uh, on uh, those matters. And uh, I wonder where that may take us. Yeah, that's the that usually gets expressed as uh, the problem of deep fakes which AI uh, can be used to put words into people's mouths uh, in a completely convincing way. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's potential for impacting our politics and our society are pretty significant. So again, it kind of comes back to us as users of AI, uh, which is not to believe everything that we're reading and seeing um, uh, on the internet. There was one other question here. Uh, yeah, this is Bob Crawford. Can you hear me? Sure. This is a thorny one, but I'll just put it very quickly. Um, I spend my winters in Arizona. It's amazing the number of people that are taking this point of view. This is my time for myself. I've worked all of these years, and there's uh, what I call a selfishness that I find creeping into what I'd call our senior group of people that are extremely healthy. And when I think back, my grandfather was a coal miner and he died six months after he left the mines. Now people are retiring at 60 and leaving till 90, healthy for a good chunk of those years. We talk about workforce development. We talk about the future of America. Is there any thought in your great organization about new innovative ways we can do to spring 
what we would call uh, intellectual curiosity in this group to get active and do something damn well for this great country we have rather than absorb it and say, this is time for me. Yeah. You know, um, I, I'll just reflect back to you a little bit of my own experience with this. Uh, I turned 60 this year. Um, uh, my own father um, decided to retire at 55 um, uh, without really having uh, the adequate, you know, enough resources to do that possibly. So he ended up back, you know, having to go back to work, kind of working in uh, a home business that my my mom was running. Um, and I think uh, the lesson that I've drawn from that is that um, uh, I don't I don't want to retire. I think retirement is uh, bad for people in many ways, uh, and it and we need to think differently about our um, about what our working lives ought to look like. Doesn't mean that we're always going to work be working full time until we drop in our cracks, um, but it does mean that. Uh, we have contributions to make um, into our old age, uh, and uh, and it's important that we plan that we plan for doing that to the extent that we can. Not everybody can. People have health challenges; they're not able to keep going, uh, keep working. Um, but my plan is not ever to fully retire. Uh, I love what I do, and I um, and I think I've got contributions to make. And one of the most important contributions that I can make, I think, is helping, um, being the kind of help to younger people that older people were to me uh, when I was um, getting started in my career. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and working on it, writing about it. Um, and I, uh, I, I don't ever want to criticize anyone for their choices uh, in terms of you know, what retirement means to them. Um, but I, 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 we don't, it seems a shame to me. It seems a shame uh, to me that we don't have access to that wisdom, to the experience, to the energy, to the ideas of, um, of older Americans who make a decision, uh, to stop contributing, um, uh, to our shared life, um, and that can take a lot of different forms. It doesn't always mean paid employment. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that's a, a full answer to your question, but I would just really encourage um, everybody to be thinking about, you know, to, to not fall into the, the trap of kind of worshiping the idea of retirement. Um, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for them. It's not healthy for the rest of us to have people um, withdraw from this shared life. We need to wrap up. Peter, I'll send your uh, question to um, around and then maybe um, he can answer it. Uh, thank you everybody for joining, uh, especially in the note of retirement, because I know there are a few people on this call who consider themselves retirees, but are also among some of the busiest people I know. <laughs> Hashtag Bob Crawford. Keep going. Uh, Keep going. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, everyone, for your engagement, for your participation, for your time, for your brain, for all that you do to help raise the world up and take care of everybody. Brent, thank you so much for your time and for your yeah. brain. Um, I took copious notes during the, <laughs> the call, and uh, I'm going to be signing up for uh, chat GPT-3. And um, in a year when we have you back, I'll report how I've done this past Okay, year. very good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your